In this video, we're going to be talking about wall integration lines. Now, wall integration lines aren't members. They're much like strip integration lines, where they're basically used to integrate results along a particular portion of your model. In this case, they're meant for vertical shell meshes, which would represent a wall in most situations. So they're meant to integrate results along a wall. Now the wall integration lines themselves don't provide any stiffness or mass, so they don't alter the behavior of your structure. But there are a few rules that you need to consider when defining them. First of all, since they do interact with 2D elements, it's important that you know that they can't intersect the interior of 2D elements. They must go along the edges, so they aren't quite as versatile in terms of where they can be laid out as a strip integration line. Also, the local XZ plane of your wall integration line should align with the plane of the wall. So here's an example here where we're drawing a wall integration line in between the elements of our mesh representing the wall. You notice, first of all, that we shrunk these elements for visual checks, but it's also showing here that the wall integration line doesn't cross any of the elements. And if we plot the X and Z axis of the local coordinate system of the wall integration line, we can see that it is indeed in plane with our wall itself. There are also a couple other tricks for wall integration lines that might be of use. For example, if you're working with the span direction tool and you're defining area loads, you may be aware that you need to define a closed polygon. Well, what happens if you have a four-sided span, but one side of those four sides, or perhaps more, is made up of shell element walls rather than beams, for example. Well, you can use wall integration lines as dummy members along those edges that would normally not have any members along the length of them. Add those to the area load members folder, and then they'll be used in the span decomposition algorithm. And it'll actually be able to apply member or joint loads rather to the joints within the mesh of your walls. And remember that they don't contribute any additional stiffness or mass. I would say a more commonly used application for wall integration lines is to actually export them to S-Concrete or ICD for design and detail. And that's not something we're really going to go into in this presentation. However, it is discussed in other webinars and training courses. One last application that can be used for is actually extruding elements like 2D elements, for example, shell elements, from a 1D element uh, model. So you can actually extrude a 2D element mesh from a 1D element model using wall integration lines. So I've got this blank model defined. It doesn't have any geometry in it yet, but I do have uh, some grids defined already. So if I go under the grid drop-down list here, I can see that I have this wall grid drop-down list, or drop-down list item. It's already been defined for me, and if we left-click on the Edit Grids tool, we can actually see some of the dimensions uh, that it's using. So it has 10 grid lines in the y direction at three and a half meter spacing and two at three meter spacing in the x direction. And then... Now I'm gonna select this grid, but I also wanna rotate it in a vertical orientation because that's gonna be more practical for me when I'm actually modeling my wall. So I can select the user coordinate system. You may remember if you've taken the G101 training course, that the grids in our model will always be in plane of the XY plane of our user coordinate system. And I've created a user coordinate system to align with the vertical plane of our wall, the UCS. This wall UCS here, you can see the XY plane is in plane with the vertical plane of our wall. Now we're going to draw this wall a little bit differently than we have uh, for the other meshes that we've looked at in these examples. I'm going to do this using the quadrilateral element tool, which is usually what's created after we've run a mesh with the panel element tool. But this is a more manual method, not quite as flexible, but it can give us a bit more control perhaps over the mesh. So I'm going to use the quadrilateral element tool. I'm going to assign a thickness to these shell elements of 200 millimeters. And I'm going to create a shell, one single shell throughout this grid using uh, the tool that I currently have. Uh, the 
And I'm going to create a shell around this grid using the quadrilateral element tool. I also want to make sure I'm using the correct material. So I use a concrete 35 MPA. So it's going to be a 200 millimeter thick concrete wall. I'm just going to left click on the grid line intersections to draw this. And I'm going to go in a counterclockwise direction. That's a user, a personal preference, I guess you could say. I like to always go in the same direction so that my local coordinate systems and my shells are always going to be aligned. And it looks like I forgot to apply my thickness, so let me just do that here really quickly. I had modify type only select. We're going to apply a 200 millimeter thickness. Now at this stage, I've got one large shell. It's not really that practical for most situations to have a shell this large, 35 meters tall. We need to break it down. So normally, if this was the panel, I could use the mesh tool and actually break down my mesh that way. However, I'm going to do things a little bit differently. I'm going to go use that Edit Subdivide tool that we've used for members and go to Edit Subdivide. And I'm actually going to break this down using another option that we have available here. So we have this Quadrilateral Elements option. And I have an IJ option. Uh, so I have the I node is the first node I clicked, which is this node here. J node is the second node I clicked, which is this node here. And then the K node would be the third node, which is right here. So that's another reason why it helps to always define your members or your shells in a consistent fashion. So I'm going to say in the IJ direction that I have three elements, three links. And in the JK direction, I'm going to have 30 links. And then I'm going to press OK. And you notice here that it subdivided my shells into even increments in each direction. Now I need to consider how I'm going to work with this further. So unlike members, I don't have a single joint at the base of my member if I want to apply supports. I need to actually consider the supports along the entire bottom edge. So let me just look at the top view of this. And you can see here that we've got four joints along the base. I'm just going to hide my grid for now since I don't really need it anymore. I have four joints along the base. Now I could define these having different support conditions on each joint if I wanted to, but to make things easy on myself, I'm going to say that all four of those joints are fully fixed. And I'm also going to apply a couple of loads. So I'm just going to go to the loads menu here. I'm going to zoom out so I can see the whole thing. And I'll call this tip load. And I'm going to apply joint loads. So at the top of this wall, I'm going to have 1,000 kilonewtons of vertical load and 100 kilonewtons of lateral load. I'm going to have four joints along the top. So in the vertical direction here, or in the, let's start with the horizontal direction since I have X4 selected. I'm going to say that I have 100 kilonewtons in total going in the lateral direction at the top of the wall, but I'm going to split that over four joints. So it's going to be 25 kilonewtons each. I'm just going to draw that in here. And I'm going to do the same thing in the Z direction, but this is going to just have a larger magnitude, so negative 250 kilonewtons. And with that, we've got our members, or sorry, our shell element wall created and loaded. Now let's go ahead and click Analyze to run the analysis. And I'm going to do a linear static analysis. You can see that we get a clean solution, which is ideal. That's what we wanted. And now I'm in the graphical results window, and I can look at some of the results. So first of all, I don't get any results if I click on the axial force diagrams or the shear or moment force diagrams, because I don't have any members within my model. So they're not going to show any of those results. However, if I were to look at, say, the deflection tool, I can see the deflections. I'm looking at the lateral deflections in this case. But I'll just display the no values so I can see the actual deflected shape. The reason we can't see those uh, member force diagrams is because we don't have any members. And since we use shells, we have shell contours. 
So I can look at different contour diagrams. Like maybe I want to look at Fx, for example. Again, that's the instantaneous normal force on the x face of our shell. Now we have different options for looking at this. We have the Fx results right now that I'm looking at. Um, but I can also right click on these here and I can go to different interpolation methods. So we can use a centroidal method, a nodal method, or an average method. And that basically dictates how S frame will grab the information that it needs to form these contours. If I switch to nodal interpolation, we can actually, in many cases, get different results than we would if we use a centroidal approach. And in this situation, the approach was quite a bit different uh, because we're now grabbing the results at each node rather than at the centroid. Again, this is discussed in more detail in the F201 finite element applications course. Now I'm looking at the Fx results, but I can also look at, say, Fy. And you notice right now with Fy, I don't see any results whatsoever. The global Fy direction, if we notice here, is the out of plane direction. And since I don't have any loads in that direction, it's not going to show me anything of interest. However, I can also look at the results for these shells with respect to the element coordinate system rather than the global coordinate system. So I can say display an element coordinate system, press OK. And now this is going to show me the results for the element coordinate system, which may not necessarily align with the global coordinate system. Again, we have our own local coordinate system defined by the i, j, and k joints within our shell elements. Now there's two different ways that we can integrate these results. We could use a on-the-fly strip integration line that we showed you in the last exercise, where I just display my mesh uh, or my shell contours, and then I left-click on my model at each joint location. So this is where I want to start my cut line. This is where I want it to end, and I want to look at the orientation of this local coordinate system of the line based on this direction, the third point. And we can pop up. This is showing me the slab design uh, strip here, but I actually want to look at the wall strip. And it will show me forces relevant to that cut line. So it's saying here that I have this much overturning moment at that location. I have this much axial load, 1,000 kilonewtons, looks right. Uh, but you can kind of get the idea of what we're getting at here. Now I'm actually going to right click on this shell contours tool and go back to the global coordinate system uh, orientation here. I'm going to uncheck this option, press OK. And just to, again, recap here, we get our global y-axis is not in line with our shell elements. If we want to actually understand our shell element orientation, we can go to the geometry window. And if I just zoom in on some of these shells here, I can click on the quadrilateral element tool. And I can look at, okay, what's the orientation of my local y-axis at the top of the data bar here? I can say display local y. And this is actually probably going to be easier to view if we look at a 2D view. And you can see that the local y is actually pointing up in this situation. And the local x is pointing to the side in the, in the global x direction as well. So that's the reason we see different uh, orientations throughout that. Now we also have wall integration lines, which is actually what we want to get into more within this exercise. So these are dummy elements with no effect on the solver. They basically just tell the GUI or the solver to give us results at a certain place. And I can add a wall integration line to my model. Let me just turn on the turn off the display of these, these um, axes here. I'm going to add a wall integration line in much the same way I added the strip integration line in the last exercise. I'm going to use the member type tool. I'm going to click on Wall Integration Line, and I'm just going to use the Member Definition tool to draw that member in. And I'm just going to draw one here right at mid-height, or as close as I can get to it. If I shrink the elements here, you'll be able to see that I have this line at mid-height. That's my Wall Integration Line. Now, as we discussed already, the, Z, the XZ axis of our Wall Integration Line should be in plane with this 
wall itself. So I'm just going to use the member axis orientation tool, which is this tool right here, where I can display the local X and the local Z, and even scale that if I wanted to. And we can see what the orientation they have relative to our wall. And lucky for us, it is in plane with our wall. Now I can also go to the settings menu and under preferences, and under the solver tab within this preferences dialog, we have this option here that says let solver rather than GUI calculate wall integration lines. And in some situations, this must be checked. Um, may not necessarily be required for this application. We're just doing a static analysis. But it is something that you should be aware of if you use wall integration lines. So this can be found under Setting Preferences under the Solver tab. Now, to get onto the exciting part, I'm going to actually run the analysis. I'll run a linear static analysis. I'm going to save the model. And now in the graphical results window, not only do I have my usual shell contours and so on, but I can look at the wall forces tool. And now I can see at this cut line across my wall, what the results are in different uh, orientations. So here I can see this is the orientation of my wall line. I can look at the FX results. So the arrow is pointing in that direction. I have 100 kilonewtons. FY, I don't have any results because that's the outer plane direction. There's no loads in that direction. SZ is my axial direction. No MX moment, that's the auto plane moment, but I do have some overturning moment, MY. So this is very useful for us when designing walls, and it's actually fully integrated within S concrete uh, and S frames workflow, and also within the integrated concrete design where you can apply a reinforced concrete wall section to these wall integration lines and then send it into the integrated concrete design. And that can be done if you have an integrated concrete design license by going into the section properties tool and just pressing concrete and assigning a section of your choice to that particular wall. I'm just going to go with this default one here. I'll just say concrete section and we're going to assign that to that wall there. 